Hey, how you doing? Nick DeGilio here. And uh, this is the uh, YouTube channel uh, or uh, Patreon is where you're watching this. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. It is free. And please uh, support me on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Nick D Show. Patreon.com slash Nick D Show. Uh, however you can donate. Uh, monthly donations, 3 bucks, 9 bucks, 25 bucks, however you want. Uh, it'll help keep the videos going. It'll help get me to, to, you know, to keep doing things like my podcasts and all that cool stuff. Um, and uh, if, uh, if you want to donate, I would love it. And you can be a patron. And as a result, you get uh, some bonuses uh, along the way in the future. And free uh, content on patreon.com slash nickdshow, including um, you know, the actual behind-the-scenes story about what really went down at a certain radio station. You'll hear all the truth about it because um, I was tired of hearing about lies and seeing lies on uh, you know, social media and on the Internet about what really happened um, uh, to me and uh, you know, how it involved me at, this, uh, at WGN. And I want the truth to be out there, and I'm tired of hearing a bunch of lies about what really happened. So if you want to hear the story, become a patron. Uh, so thanks. Okay, so uh, The Matrix Resurrections um, has been released, and I saw it. Uh, saw it in IMAX uh, yesterday. Now, I've made no secret about the fact that I love uh, The Matrix movies. Um, I back all three of them. I think uh, Reloaded and Revolutions are both good films. Uh, obviously not as uh, good as the original, not as, um, um, you know, the original Matrix was a revolutionary movie. There was nothing like it ever. Uh, and it still remains one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, and I was very excited for the sequels back in 2003. I could not have been more excited. And, um, you know, inevitably with a movie that was that impactful and that different, and that revolutionary, uh, inevitably people are going to be disappointed by the follow-ups. Um, and I can understand that, the, the, uh, the, the two films, the uh, Reloaded and Revolutions, are not as good as, as the first film, but they uh, expanded the mythology. Uh, they tried to do something new and different, and in fact they did do something new and different, and they were way, again, like the first movie, way ahead of the game. Uh, the kind of themes and the kind of stuff that was touched on in the sequels to the Matrix are now commonplace in science fiction and fantasy movies uh, and television series, and, uh, and you know, and, and themes that had never really been touched on in the sequels are now regular. You know, that's a regular thing now. So again, the Wachowskis were way ahead of the game um, as they were when the first Matrix movie came out. Um, so uh, I have always been a, a huge fan of the Wachowskis. I think that they um, have made some really great movies. Even the stuff that people. Even the stuff that uh, people you know don't like, like Cloud Atlas uh, or Jupiter Descending, things like that, I have liked, or at least found, at, the, at the very least, uh, interesting. Uh, Sense Eight, their science fiction um, uh, TV show, a Netflix show, I found to be fascinating and original and awesome. Uh, so the thing about the Matrix uh, movies and the Wachowskis in in, in general is that they're there's an important thing that, you, that that needs to be remembered. The Wachowskis are uh, are, are trans are trans artists, uh, and they were trans people who were yet to publicly come out when the original Matrix and its sequels were made. Um, and now they are out. They are trans, and um, they are now two different people, literally completely two different people than they were when the first Matrix movie was made. The new Matrix film. Um, Lily is not a part of, but Lana is, Lana Wachowski. Uh, Lana Wachowski uh, came up with the original idea, as she did, you know, making the original Matrix, you know, uh, and she directed this one solo. Um, and, and that's an important thing to note, is that this is the first film that Lana has made on her own as a publicly out trans person, as a trans artist. And that is what this movie's about. That is what the Matrix Resurrections is about. It's her statement uh, as uh, uh, her first fully, you know, formed statement as an artist in the Matrix world as a trans person. And that's what the themes of the movie are about. And all of the themes that have been found all the way back to the original Matrix about rebirth um, and about identity uh, have now come to fruition uh, in a very personal movie. This is one of the most personal Hollywood movies that I've seen a filmmaker make 
uh, especially a trans filmmaker, make. And it is, as far as, you know, like big budget blockbuster Hollywood movies, it is one of the most important and I think the biggest in terms of what it's saying about being trans uh, in today's world. And this director, uh, Lana uh, Wachowski, Wachowski, uh, taking her story and putting it into this big budget science fiction epic uh, and making one, I think, one of the boldest, most personal, most striking, and most emotional statements about being trans ever made. Uh, that's what this movie is about. So, yes, it does fulfill you know, the expectations of uh, big action set pieces. Um, it does have all of the philosophy and all of the wonderful sort of uh, mythology and gobbledygook that is jammed into the other Matrix movies. It's got all of that, and it's got kung fu, and it's got, you know, big special effects. It's got bullet time. It mentions bullet time a bunch of times. Uh, and it's got big, giant action set pieces and the return of some of the iconic characters that were created by the Wachowskis back in 1999. So all of that is there. All of the stuff that you want in a Matrix movie is there, but ultimately this movie is a statement from Lana uh, Wachowski uh, about her publicly and defiantly and beautifully and honestly talking about her position as a trans person in her life uh, and what that means. That's what this movie's about. Don't 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 think it's just your average like sci-fi movie with all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's got all that in it. But the important thing about this movie is that it's about, it's a personal statement about Lana and being a trans artist and being a trans person and the triumph of that in her life. That's what this movie is about. Don't think it's about anything else because it isn't. That's what it's about. Uh, so uh, basically, if you, quick uh, rundown of the plot. Uh, Thomas Anderson, we all remember him, uh, is now, this is years later after, you know, these incidents that took place in the Matrix. And uh, he doesn't really have, he has these weird memories about it, but he doesn't remember anything. It doesn't exist to him. This whole time that he spent in the Matrix, he now has created a video game. He's an unbelievably successful video game designer for Warner Brothers, uh, and he has designed the Matrix Trilogy these games. This is what Thomas Anderson does. He's a multimillionaire, incredibly successful game designer. People love his games. They love The Matrix and its its sequels and The Matrix trilogy. Um, he goes to an analyst, played by uh, Neil Patrick Harris, uh, because he has these weird dreams and these weird visions that he uh, filters through these Matrix video games that he has made. Uh, his boss, uh, who is a uh, played by uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, uh, Jonathan Groff, um, is the boss at the Warner Brothers. They uh, want another sequel to the video game. They want a fourth Matrix. Uh, and so he's, you know, he's conflicted about doing it. He doesn't really want to do it. So it's no coincidence that in this movie, um, Keanu Reeves plays a guy who works for Warner Brothers, and they want a fourth Matrix. Uh, because that's exactly what happened. And Warner Brothers was going to go uh, on with it, with the fourth Matrix, if the if the Wachowskis were not part of it, whether or not they were going to be part of it or not, Warner Brothers was going to do it. So Lana said, okay, I'm going to do it. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. And uh, so, yes, so that becomes part of it. Now, uh, the opening sequence in the movie is kind of a variation on the very opening sequence of the first Matrix movie, only something is a little bit off. Uh, two new characters, um, Sequoia and Bugs, uh, are, are in the same in the scene that opens up the first Matrix movie. That iconic scene uh, with Carrie Ann Moss as Trinity kicking all the policemen's ass and Agent Smith and chasing them and all of that stuff. It's all recreated, but everything is just slightly off. So they know that there's something going on, that there's a glitch again in the Matrix, and that they need to find and bring Neo back in. Um, you know, to take the, the, once again, take the red pill. Uh, there's a new Morpheus. Uh, there is a new Agent Smith. Things have changed, but there is a conflict again, and they need to fix it. Uh, and Trinity is somewhere in there. So Neil gets sucked back into it. He takes the red pill, and all the adventures begin, and then they search, you know, the, the rebellion still exists. There's now a ship. Not, it's not called the Nebuchadnezzar. It's not called the Resistance. There's a brand new crew that's very similar to the crew that was in the Nebuchadnezzar in the original movie. And it's all up to Neo to save that universe and to find Trinity 
uh, and to, to, to bring Trinity out uh, of the Matrix and to, uh, to reunite Neo and Trinity. And ultimately it becomes this uh, love story, as it always was, between Neo and between Trinity, this beautiful love story. Um, now, I happen to... Trinity is my favorite character in the entire series. I love Carrie Ann Moss. I love the character of Trinity. And to me, it's always been about that connection and that love between Neo and Trinity. Um, and that's what this movie explores. Uh, and it explores it uh, in many ways. Uh, some of the older characters come back. Uh, Jada Pinkett Smith makes another appearance. Uh, some of the other characters, uh, uh, you know, come back. Uh, there are new characters and in and, and action and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but ultimately, this, again, as I said, is a statement from Lana about being trans and a statement about uh, the triumph that she feels as a trans artist. That's what this movie is about. Um, so, yes, there are a lot of meta uh, and callback moments in the movie. Uh, but unlike uh, crap like uh, the Ghostbusters Afterlife movie and the terrible Spider-Man movie, uh, they're not just thrown in as creature comforts. They're not, it's not, you know, making fans feel good. It's not fan service. It's not just regurgitated, um, you know, uh, uh, comfort food, uh, uh, you know, you know, fan service and, and, and tropes from, uh, you know, that we've loved before. Although it's there, there's no question about it, it's there. Uh, for the first, like, third of the movie, all of those, uh, uh, those things that, that they bring back are played for laughs. In fact, it's a satire. The first half, half hour of the movie is hilarious, especially about, you know, the meta callbacks um, that, you know, are just brazenly regurgitated all over the Ghostbusters movie um, and, and all over the Spider-Man movie with... The only concern is to, oh, let's let everybody in on the little joke and make everybody feel a little bit better and smarter because we threw these jokes in. Uh, no, in this movie, in the first half hour of this movie, it's a devastating satire on how shitty and stupid um, these tropes are. That being meta and inside jokey um, is not quite as clever as you think it is. And the first half hour of this movie rips that shit to shreds. Uh, does... Everything that the Ghostbusters and the Spider-Man movie doesn't do handles it intelligently, makes fun of it, uh, and is able to actually have its cake and eat it too. Is able to bring in the meta callbacks and yet completely make fun of them and satirize them at the same time. But also use those meta callbacks um, to tell the story that Lana Wachowski, Wachowski wants to tell. And that is what it, what it was like for her to triumphantly become a trans artist and a trans person. And that's what they're used for. They're not just there for decoration. The meta callbacks, they're not just there, you know, like in the stupid Ghostbusters and Spider-Man movie. They're there to actually push the plot ahead and to make a statement about what this filmmaker wants to make. Uh, and ultimately, um, it succeeds on every level. It is a terrific action movie. It's a great sci-fi movie. Like I said, it's got all the mythology and all the gobbledygook that we love uh, to, to hear in the Matrix movies. It's got hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's got incredible special effects, and giant action set pieces that are really, really great. Uh, characters that we loved are back. They're changed a little bit, but that's all explained. Um, um, and there's actually a line late in the movie that is, uh, nothing comforts anxiety like a little nostalgia. Um, and that's true. It's absolutely true, but uh, Lana's making fun of that as well. So uh, it, this is a movie that actually reminded me of Wes Craven's New Nightmare um, in that, that, you know, like Scream and all those, you know, a lot of those movies before, they were, they, they were meta before it was cool to be meta. Uh, and New Nightmare, I think, is the best of all of them. Um, and New Nightmare was uh, Wes Craven coming back to make a sequel to a series that kind of got out of his hands um, and, you know, lost its original tract. Um, and uh, Wes Craven came back fully acknowledging uh, that it's a series of movies, that there were Nightmare on Elm Street movies, and within that context, making a Nightmare on Elm Street movie, within the meta world of knowing it's a Nightmare on Elm Street movie, and knowing that it's a sequel to a series that had gotten out of hand and could have gotten worse. Uh, and that's exactly what Lana's doing here. Um, under the guise that in the movie, it's a video game. And that, you know, Mr. Anderson has made these Matrix sequels and that Warner Brothers wants another video game 
and uh, they're going to do it with or without his consent uh, or his involvement. And so that's what the movie's about. That's the statement that Lana's making. And as a result, she makes a kick-ass science fiction uh, action movie, everything you'd expect from that, and yet uh, making a movie about uh, the world of, uh, of being a trans person. It is a movie about identity. It's about rebirth. Uh, if you go back and look at the original Matrix, knowing now that um, the two people that made it were trans people who were not out publicly yet, the themes and what that movie was about are so trans uh, in, 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 in what they're saying uh, that it, it seems obvious now when you go back and you look at it. Um, but this is this movie is a triumph of that. This is everything that um, you know she wanted to make, um, and 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 a statement that that as a trans person she wanted to make, and it's a triumph of that. Uh, there is a moment late in the movie where uh, a female character takes over for a male character, very late in the film. Um, and takes the takes the role of a, of this male character and completely overshadows it and takes over the role of this male character and it's a it is a moment of freeing statement a freeing statement that I've rarely seen in in a big Hollywood movie uh, it's the most exhilarating moment in the movie um, I teared up a little bit uh, the statement that this moment is saying is very important. Um, and very important to, to, to Lana and very important to uh, trans artists um, on such a huge scale. This is a multi-million dollar sequel to a multi-billion dollar success. Um, and here is this incredible filmmaker making as personal a statement as you could possibly make about being trans at this time in this world. And that's what the movie's about. And that moment where the female character totally usurps and takes over the male character uh, in a triumphant fashion it is a, it, it's an exhilarating, beautiful personal, incredible moment um, it's not you know, it's not a moment of incredible science fiction or incredible special effects or big action or explosions or anything like that, it is a, it, it's a moment that's, that's vital to the movie and a moment that's very exciting to, you know, to the plot of the film, but it's a statement being made by Lana Wachowski uh, about being trans and uh, her triumph in that regard, that's one of the most personal things I've seen in a big budget movie ever, ever. So um, that's really at its core, that's what this movie's about. Um, I also think that there are uh, some, you know, some changes to the world of The Matrix that also reflect the changes in Lana as a person, as a trans person. Uh, I think the casting of Neil Patrick Harris as uh, the analyst is uh, is telling um, and uh, completely on point and completely on purpose. Uh, everything looks a little more fabulous in this movie. Um, you know, even Zion, there's no, really no Zion, but even the real world, which, you know, was filled with, you ate a bunch of crappy food and slop and junk and everybody looked dark and everything. A little more color now. Uh, they're eating beautiful, juicy red strawberries now. Things are a little more fabulous uh, in this movie. The costumes are a little different. Not everybody's wearing the black on black with the black sunglasses. It's more colorful. There just seems to be a little more joy in the Matrix at this time. A little more color. A little more fabulousness, uh, if you will. And that's all what this movie's about. It's about this triumph that personally Lana had. Uh, as a trans person becoming uh, a, a very successful trans artist and uh, and her personal story. It's her personal story and that's what this movie's about. Uh, and as a result, it's also about her sister Lily um, and about the Wachowskis' journey um, as people who were not publicly out as trans people when they made the first Matrix, now they are uh, and they're going to make statements about it and, and this is Lana's statement. Um, about her being uh, a, a, a successful, wonderful, brilliant trans artist in this time. And she brought more color to it, brought more fabulousness to it, um, and, uh, and I loved it, and I loved it. And again, that moment very late in the movie, one of the most exhilarating and freeing moments I've ever seen, one of the most open statements about uh, the private world and the, the, the beauty uh, of, of a filmmaker's life ever told. Um, so, yeah. And then on the simplest of levels, it's a kick-ass Matrix movie. It's got all the stuff that you want. 
It's got the hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's got the special effects. It's got the big... The last, like, 40 minutes of this movie is one giant, awesome fucking action set piece after another, after another, after another. The final 40 minutes of this movie is packed with jaw-dropping, big, cool, awesome action set pieces and special effects, the kind of really cool shit that you expect when you see a Matrix movie. But it's more than that. It's a lot more than that. It is everything you want in a Matrix movie. More of the mythology, more of the cool shit that we all love. Big, giant action special effects, kung fu, all of that stuff. Neo, you know, Keanu. And that love story, again, the love story uh, between Neo and Trinity. And I love Trinity's character in this. Uh, she's called Tiffany for a while in the movie. And she's got a husband named Chad and a couple of kids. And all that's played beautifully. Uh, again, Carrie Ann, uh, Carrie Ann Moss, one of my favorite uh, characters ever. And uh, that love story between the two of them is the core of the movie. Um, and it's beautiful. So uh, the Neo, the Trinity love story, it's the emotional core of the Matrix movie. They kick ass. There's action. There's new characters. Um, everything that you love about Matrix movies, the big, bold mythology, sci-fi greatness, it's all there. And yet, it's one of the most personal, big-budget uh, Hollywood movies I've ever seen. And one of the most important statements from a trans filmmaker ever of all time. Um, that's what this movie at its core is about. And that's why it's beautiful. And that's why it's not uh, wasting its meta callbacks the same way that these other stupid reboots are. They make them, the, the re, the, you know, the callbacks and the meta stuff in this movie, it counts. It means something. And it's making a statement, a personal statement about a filmmaker who is making a very open and beautiful statement about being trans and being a trans artist. So, uh, anyway, if you're just looking for a great action movie, if you're just looking for a great uh, Matrix movie, it delivers. Uh, Matrix Resurrections absolutely, completely delivers on that level of greatness uh, in terms of a simple action sci-fi movie. But there's a lot more going on, too. And that's what it really is. And that's what really makes the movie important. There's a lot going on. It's an important movie. It's a terrific movie. And thank you, uh, Lana Wachowski, for sharing your story, your personal beautiful story. Uh, it's not only really cool, but it also kicks ass. So I loved it. I thought it was terrific. Matrix Resurrections. Uh, if you can see it on the big screen, go ahead. But, you know, if you don't want to go out to a movie now, and I know that uh, there's been a, a lot of concern about going out because of the, the COVID resurgence, uh, and all of that. Uh, it is available on HBO Max. Uh, but watch it, and watch it with a different eye uh, this time. It's great. So, Matrix Resurrections, as a Matrix fanatic, loved it. As a fan of Neo, loved it. And as a complete, you know, worshiper of Trinity and everything Trinity does, um, it is, um, it's great. So, see Matrix Resurrections. Thanks a lot. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, and uh, check out my podcast, which uh, will debut on the Radio Misfits Network in late January. All right, thank you.